Well, you guys, I'm so excited to jump into our part four of how to pray. And we've been looking in this series about how to pray the last uh, last two weeks. So this week and last week, we've been using an acronym, P-R-A-Y, which is uh, P is, is for pause, R is for rejoice. We talked about those two last week. And today I want to talk to us about A, which is ask, and Y, which is yield or yes. Uh, I'll, I'll just go with yield for today, but if you prefer yes, you can roll with that. So PR. A Y. And as we've been talking about how to pray, we've talked about uh, just kind of the simple idea of keeping it real, keeping it simple, and keeping it up. Keeping it simple, keeping it real, keeping it up. And that's something we've been trying to do. And again, we've been looking at pray, P R A Y, as a way or a pattern of how we can do that. And so today, I have two simple points for you. I've actually got some sub points, so you're still going to need to get ready and you're going to need to write. But if you are a note taker and you just want the uh, the advanced reader version of this, I'm going to give you two main points today. And you probably already guessed what they are, but it is A, ask. And the second point is going to be uh, why? Yield. So ask and yield. And we're going to talk about that today. What does it look like to ask and what does it look like to yield in the place of prayer? And again, last week we talked about P, which was pausing, and R, which was rejoicing. We talked about how that really brought an intimacy to our prayer life. It wasn't just about a transactional thing that was happening of us asking for something. It's kind of like a father and a child. Yes, there are times when a father gives gifts to a child, but then there are times when the child just says, thank you for the gift, but I actually want to to be with you. And we talked about that rejoicing kind of moment and how that makes it intimate, not just transactional. Today, when we, as we get into point one, which is ask, this is probably the most basic instinctive way that many of us pray. And God is totally good with this type of praying. Actually, God tells us that we should be asking. So uh, beyond it's okay, it's actually uh, it, we're informed to do this. This is us asking God for stuff or us asking God for help. And it's actually interesting. Uh, there's these two kind of super spiritual biblical words. One is, um, is, uh, petition and one is intercession. And petition is when we are asking God for stuff or for help for ourselves. We're petitioning God. We're asking him for, for ourselves. And then intercession is when we are asking God for stuff or help for someone else. So it's actually when we uh, are asking God for someone else. So asking in prayer is very basic. It's very instinctive. And, um, and petition is when we're asking for ourselves and intercession is when we are asking on behalf of someone else. In the scripture, again, not only does it say that we can ask, it says that we should ask. And in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, this is the portion of scripture where Jesus is, where the disciples go to Jesus and say, teach us how to pray. And Jesus says this. He says, pray then like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. We talked about how that was that rejoicing part of just, God, you're my Father. This is relational. I'm rejoicing in your name. You are set apart. You're holy. There's no one like you. We talked about that last week, and you can go back and listen to that for free free and all of our media outlets are on our app. And by the way, if you haven't downloaded the app, make sure that you do that. All of that's on there. Verse 10, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the part that I want you to see. Verse 11, Matthew 6, verse 11, it says, give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Now, this is a throwback from Jesus to the Old Testament where manna would actually come down for the Israelites daily from heaven. This is when they were in the desert and God was teaching the Israelites to depend upon him instead of depending on Egypt, which is where they had been slaves for over 400 years. And they had a certain methodology and understanding of what it was like to actually receive sustenance and where they were dependent upon. And God was teaching them to find a new source. He was teaching them that he was going to be their provider. And he began to uh, daily rain, rain down manna from heaven in the desert which manna literally means, if you go back to the original language, it means, what is it? They didn't even know what it was. It started falling from heaven. And it was like, says, it was like dew on the ground. They would go collect it in a jar and they would look at each other and they would be like, well, what is it? Uh, we'll just call it that. We'll call it what is it? Because we don't even know what it is. And the Bible says you cannot collect more than more than enough for a day. Because if, if you collect it for two days, it's going to spoil. So the idea is uh, you could collect two, just to be super clear, you could collect for two days once a week so that you didn't collect on the Sabbath. That's a whole nother topic. But you collected for that day. And if you collected for that day and the next day, the next day's portion of manna would actually rot in the jar. And so God was teaching them daily to depend upon him for their sustenance, for their provision. He was training them to learn a new 
uh, a new source, and that he was their source, that he was their provider. And so here Jesus is actually giving us a throwback to that Old Testament idea and saying, hey, you should daily be asking God for your sustenance, for provision. You should daily be asking God for the daily bread. This is part of prayer. This is the ask. This is, and then to continue out uh, here, it says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So the point is we need to ask. We're supposed to ask God for our daily bread. We're supposed to go to him with our needs so that he can meet them. This is asking petition for ourselves, intercession for others. To give you another portion of scripture here, Matthew 7, 7 and 8, I'll read out the New King James Version. It says this, it says, ask, so there's our word for, the, for this, this section of today, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For whoever asks, receives, and whoever seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. And this is really interesting because, again, in the Greek language, which the New Testament primarily is written in, this is actually what they call the continuous present tense, which means it's present tense, it's now, so the asking and the seeking and the knocking is present, it's something we're doing right now, but it's the continuous present tense, which means that it's continual. So it's present tense, but it's continual present tense. It means, literally, it means to to keep, to ask and keep asking, to knock and to keep knocking, to seek and to keep seeking. So not only are we told to ask in the scripture, we are told to ask in the continuous present tense, ask and keep asking. And those who ask and keep asking will receive. Now, this is a promise from scripture. And we might pause at a moment like this and say, Pastor Scott, what about unanswered prayer? Well, that's a great question. And it's one that we all deal with. And by the way, this is not a, a simple kind of plastic kind of uh, answer. Uh, unanswered prayers are one of the biggest things that we wrestle with as Christians. It's such an important topic that one of the things we want to do as a church is we actually want to explore more deeply. And one of the things I'm going to be doing this fall, which will be starting in a few weeks here in the, in the middle of September, is I'm going to be leading an e-group called How to Pray. We're going to be going through a book by Pete Gregg, which some of this content is based on. And um, and we're actually going to be studying prayer and learning how to pray. And so I want to invite you, if this is something that resonates with you, would you sign up for the e-group? You can do it in person if you're here in the area, or you can do it online from right where you are. And we will uh, create a, a way for you to do that. But we need you to sign up. So go to the element.church uh, e-groups page, and you can actually find the, the e-group, How to Pray, and you can sign up for that right on our e-groups page. But um, here's, here's the short answer. Wh why? Uh, what about unanswered prayers? Sometimes we don't know. We, we don't understand everything. But just because we don't understand everything doesn't mean we, we, we don't know some things. And there are some things that we can eliminate from the equation. One of the things we can eliminate is that God, we know God's good. Uh, we know that he's good. We know that we can trust him. We know that he cares. And, you know, it's funny in the New Testament, whenever uh, the disciples seem to think that Jesus isn't doing what he should be doing, the first thing that they constantly do is they challenge whether he cares for them or not. When, when there's a big storm that comes in, they're on a boat, and there's a big storm that comes in, and it says Jesus is in the bottom of the boat sleeping. It says they go and wake Jesus up in the middle of the storm, and they don't say to him, do something, we're scared. Well, that was probably what they should have said. What they did is they, they shake him awake, and they say, don't you care? We're going to drown, like we're going to drown. And so isn't it funny that whenever there is something that we sense God needs to be doing that he's not doing, our very first step often is to challenge his care for us. We, we know from the scripture that Jesus came and died on the cross to meet our needs. This is not a God who doesn't care. And it's not a, he's not a God who isn't good. He's not a God who's uninvolved. So we can eliminate those possibilities. What about unanswered prayer? We don't always know. But there are some things we can eliminate, and we can explore this more deeply, and I want to invite you to do that by joining that e-group. I want to ask another question here. Um, why do we ask God for things if he already knows what we need? There's some scripture that says, in Matthew, it says that God knows what you need before you even ask him. So why ask him? Why does the Bible tell us to ask if God already knows what we need? That seems silly. And I would... Uh, I would say, well, there's probably a whole lot of reasons, and I actually wrote several down, and I, I, I wanted to kind of go through, but um, although God knows our need, he still wants us to articulate it. I mean, that's the overarching idea, is for some reason, God still wants us to articulate the need, even though he already knows what the need is. And I, I wrote some reasons down that I could think of. There's probably a whole bunch more, but I just wanted to give these to you. Um, why do I need to articulate my need 
if God already knows. I need, just, just real quick, I'll take a half a step back from that. In the New Testament, there's a story of blind Bartimaeus. He's blind. Everybody knows he's blind. And Jesus shows up, and they have this exchange where Bartimaeus and Jesus meet, and Jesus says to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus says, I want to see. Uh, everybody there knows that he's blind. Everybody knows that he wants to see, and yet Jesus wants him to articulate that need. Again, why? Probably a lot of reasons. Here's a couple. Um, why would I need to articulate my need if God already knows? Uh, one thought is so that I actually can understand what I need, what I can work out what I need. And we're going to get into this more in just a moment. You'll, we'll delve into this a little bit, but oftentimes I'm praying so abstract or I'm praying in such a desperate place, or I'm praying that I'm praying these prayers that they really need to be processed through. Sometimes I'm praying prayers that wouldn't even be good for me if they actually came to pass. And, but I haven't really taken the time to process through the fact that that is actually probably not something I actually need. And I think sometimes God wants me to articulate my needs to him because they're not actually needs or because they're things that would be bad for me or because it's something that would be good for me and something I really do need, but I don't fully understand what I'm asking for. I don't think God needs me to articulate my need to him because he doesn't know. I think sometimes he needs me to articulate my needs so that I actually know and so that I could actually know whether he answers me or not. That was another one that I wrote down. I also wrote down so that I can work out... Um, what I want. Sometimes I don't even know what I want. I, you know, I don't know if you're like me. Sometimes we just pray, God, whatever you want. And you know, there's just these abstract kind of prayers. Sometimes it's hard for me to actually figure out what I want. So if, you know, obviously blind Bartimaeus, he knows he's like, I want to see, but sometimes Jesus might ask us, what do you want? The father might ask us, what do you want? It's like, I don't really know. I mean, I could kick out a bunch of stuff, but what do I really truly need? What do I really truly want? I don't know. Well, Jesus would like me to articulate that. Maybe so that, again, I can know. Um, I wrote, so I can see when I ask amiss. The Bible says, ask in Jesus' name, ask and you'll you will receive um, unless you ask amiss. And so sometimes I'm asking for something that's out of line with God's character, out of line with God's nature, out of line with God's will. If I actually articulate it, I actually can see that in prayer. Um, sometimes it's so that I can understand the question behind the question. You know, it's interesting sometimes when I'm talking to God about my needs, I'm asking for things. God will ask me a question. I remember uh, being on a silence and solitude uh, two years ago. I was uh, around my 40th birthday, and I, I said to, uh, to God in just in a time of prayer, I said, I, I need to know the plan for the next, you know, the second half of my life. I, I need some direction. I need, I need you to lay out the plan for the next 40 years, I think is kind of how I phrased it up. And uh, I sensed the Spirit speak to my heart and say, I can't give you a plan for the next 40 years. And I thought, well, that stinks, you know, I mean, um, and then I felt the Spirit kind of speak to me again and say, it's not that I wouldn't want to, it's that it doesn't work like that, Scott. You don't need a plan, you need a guide. You don't need something on paper. You need actually a person to walk with you. And he's, you know, again, close the loops on this. By the way, he said, I, I'm that person. I'm that guide. And if you were in a war-torn country, you wouldn't want a paper map of how to get from one country to another. You would want a guide to go with you who knew the lay of the land and the different roads and the different languages and the different neighborhoods and the different ways of navigating the terrain. You would need a living, active, dynamic guide. You wouldn't need a plan on paper. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, and Scott, there are doors that if I open now, you wouldn't walk through. There are people that you've not yet met that are going to be instrumental to the things that I want to do through you. And then he said, everything that I want to do through you for the next 40 years will come out of intimacy with me. That's, that's the question behind the question. And God has a way, doesn't he, of asking us questions or pressing in on things when we articulate what we want he actually can press back in with us and help us see the question behind the question. So why do we need to articulate our needs when God already knows? These are all reasons. I'm going to give you a couple more really quick so that I can change my understanding of things. So we know that God moves when God moves. Again, articulating and having clarity so that we can help others learn how to ask according to his will. As I articulate needs, other people, if I'm praying in a group, they can understand how to pray. They can understand how to exchange with God. These are all important reasons why we articulate and actually ask what we need. Um, what are some practicals on this? How do we ask? Let me give you a couple quick things here. A, um, practicals, learning to ask. We need to learn to ask or learn to pray with others. As we learn to pray with others, as I just alluded to, we actually can learn to ask God in ways that actually are in line with his will. And there's a power in us praying together. You know, um, it's interesting, isn't it, that the Bible says in Matthew 18, 20, it says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, 
there I am with them. Matthew 18, 20. Now, we know God is with us individually as well. We know the Holy Spirit lives in us. We understand that theologically. But there's something about being with other people. And if you've ever been in a, a great prayer meeting with other people, you know that there's something about this. There's something powerful about this. We learn to pray by being around others who pray. And so if we're going to learn to ask well, we need to learn to pray with others and to learn from other people. There's a power in praying together. A second thought here practically about learning to ask is that we need to learn to pray incrementally. We need to learn to ask incrementally. And um, as a big picture person, sometimes I can give God very big, very broad kind of prayers. God, be, be with my kids today. Well, what does that really mean exactly? And how would I know if God answered that prayer? Um, that, there's probably some pretty poor filters that kind of fall out of that kind of abstract prayer. Again, not that God's against those kind of prayers. He's good with those kind of prayers. But I think that we need to learn to ask, learn to pray incrementally. Um, yes, we pray for, let's take healing, for example. I want to pray for a miracle of healing. But if I learn to think incrementally, maybe instead of just praying, God, just touch them and heal them 100%, which I, I'm good praying that prayer, and I will pray that prayer, and I have seen God touch people miraculously. But also incrementally, maybe I would pray for wisdom for the doctors as they go into an appointment the week that I'm praying for them. Maybe I would pray for a, a specific uh, type of way in which their body could fight back. And I would pray for something down to incrementally as small as a, a specific body part. Maybe, maybe uh, who, who knows? But as we start to break these things down and get incremental, I, I heard um, this years ago, there's a gentleman named T.D. Jakes, and he talked in a sermon I'm going to take you through it. Trust me, it makes sense and it connects if you just hang with me for a second. But he started with the idea of safaris. He was on a safari in Africa and he was kind of going through Africa and he was seeing all these wild animals. He saw elephants and they were so strong and he saw lions and they, uh, cheetahs and he saw cheetahs were so fast and rhinos had these like this really thick skin with horns and could defend themselves. And he found himself kind of asking God as he was kind of looking at all these amazing animals God, what is our defense as humans? I mean, like, <laughs> there's all these really strong, big, fast, aggressive animals. And he was like, what is our defense? And he felt like the Holy Spirit prompted him and said, your, your brain and your mouth, like, you have this creative ability that I gave you to think and to create and to form things. And he started thinking about that. And, um, you know, kind of this idea of partnering with God and, and creating with God and and then he kind of went from that into this idea that we're kind of starting to talk about right here. And he said that he had this analogy that came to him about tables and trees. And he said that oftentimes what we do is we ask God for tables. We'll pray for tables. We'll be in church and we'll ask for tables. But he said this, he said, but God doesn't actually make tables. God makes trees. And trees, when they are, uh, when, when humans partner with God, the trees that God made can become tables. And he said, so what we do so often is that we will get on our knees and we will cry and we will beg and, and we will say, God, I need a table. And again, it's an analogy. It's an example, but hang with me. God, I need a table. And that God, the spirit of God would say, I don't make tables, but there are trees all around you. There's trees everywhere. And if you will open your eyes to the trees, you won't be asking for a table. That when you stare at trees, when humans look at trees, they can see tables. When humans look at trees, they can see chairs and walls and log cabins and toys. And because God makes trees and humans make tables. And here's the thing. I, I brought this back up. I feel like the spirit prompted this analogy back on my heart as I was preparing for this week because, because so often I find myself praying these big prayers. God, I need a table. God, I need a table. If God, if you would just manufacture and drop a table right in front of me, that'd be great. And I feel like the spirit would say, you have to learn to pray and ask incrementally because I am working all around you. There are trees absolutely everywhere. You're asking me for a table, but I don't make tables. I make trees. But if you will open your eyes to the trees, I will walk with you and show you how to make a table, but it's your job to make the table. So here's the thing, you guys, is we have to learn to pray incrementally because so often in my life, I'm guilty 
guilty of asking God for a table when God's answer to me would be, there are trees everywhere. Why don't you ask me for the wisdom of how to make a table? Or why don't you ask me to open your eyes so that you can see the trees? Or why don't you ask me to, to, to get, it, get you to a place where there are trees, if there aren't any? You get the idea, guys. We have to start learning to pray incrementally. Pray for wisdom to make a table. Pray for vision to see the trees that God has put all around you. So here's the question that I want to ask you about this idea is this. What's the next little prayer that you can pray as a step toward the larger prayer that you're praying? Because we have to learn to pray incrementally. So if maybe if it's your finances, we could say, God, I need you to wipe out all of my debt. And God, I need like a million dollars and, and, you know, help me win the lottery. And here's the thing. God's fine with that prayer. And God probably, I don't know if God helps people win the lottery. That's maybe for theologians above my pay grade. But I know this. Maybe the better prayer incrementally would be, God, would you give me opportunities for creative income? God, would you give me creative opportunities in ways I can make money? God, would you give me, God, and it, would you expand my ability and my strength to get wealth on the earth? God, would you give me wisdom for self-awareness, God, so that I could see marketable skills that are maybe easy for me that aren't easy for other people. And so in all of a sudden, instead of praying for a lottery ticket to actually boom, we are actually begin to pray that God would open doors of opportunity for us, that we would be able to see what we're good at and what maybe are marketable skills that we already have. And you see how this starts to work as we start to think incrementally. Why does God ask us to put, to articulate our needs? We need to learn to pray incrementally. I could probably talk and teach on that for quite some time. I'm going to go to the next point, but I, I think you get the idea, and I hope you get the idea. We need to learn to pray incrementally. So, you guys, we need to learn to pray with others. We need to learn to play, pray incrementally. We need to learn to pray God's promises. The Bible says if we ask anything in Jesus' name, it'll be done. That doesn't just mean that you slap Jesus' name on your prayer for a portion. It just automatically happens. What it means is that we are praying in line with God's will and agenda. And that when we pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' will, in Jesus' agenda, when we pray in line with what the Father is longing for, guys, it happens. And so what we need to learn is not just to pray our words, although God's good with those prayers and we should pray those prayers, we need to learn to pray God's promises. These are not vague prayers. These are prayers that are specific, and they are prayers that are in line with God's will as revealed in Scripture. I wanted to pull up an, an analogy, an example. I could pray for you for healing, and I could pray, God, would you heal my friend? God, would you heal your son or daughter? God, you care about them, and I just pray your healing over them. And that would be a fine prayer, and it would be a good prayer, and God meets those prayers. But a more specific prayer, a more incremental prayer, a more direct prayer, and a prayer in line with God's promise might sound something like this out of Romans 11. Let me read you the verse and then I'll pray it. The verse says, Romans 8, 11, it says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body, mortal body, because of his spirit who lives in you. Let me paraphrase that. It says, look, the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus that rose him from the dead lives in you. And if that spirit lives in you, it will bring life. That spirit, the Holy Spirit will bring life to your mortal body. That's a promise for here and now. That's not healing someday by and by. That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a gift of healing. And so instead of just saying, God, would you heal my friend? I would say, God, I pray right now, God, that the spirit of the living God, that you would come. And I pray, God, that the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead will, God, will dwell strong in my friend, driving out sickness and disease from the top of the head to the bottom of their feet. And God, that your spirit that rose Jesus from the dead will bring life to their mortal body, which is a promise for right now. And God, I pray that that spirit, Holy Spirit, that you live in them and that you will be bringing life to their mortal body and healing them now in Jesus' name. I think the second prayer is better. And I think that I have more conviction to pray the second prayer because I feel like I'm tapping into something that's in line with God's will and in line with God's word. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Now, this works for everything. It works for our mental health. It works for, guys, it works for everything. To explore the word of God and to learn to pray God's promises. This is really important. And the last kind of maybe practical here for learning to ask ways to ask. Remember, that's what we're doing here, learning how to pray. And we're P-R-A, ask. That's where we're at. Ask is this, is to learn to pray consistently, to learn to pray consistently. So often I'm guilty of just kind of throwing up like a big prayer, a prayer in a time of desperation or need, and then just kind of going away from it and, and not really coming back. And we read this earlier in Matthew um, 7, 7 and 8 in the New King James says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. 
Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everybody who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. I want to read you the New Living Translation. Remember I said it was the continuous present tense. The New Living Translation kind of tries to capture that. It says this, keep on asking, (laughs) and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. There's an analogy that I heard that sometimes we feel like prayer is like taking like a small stone or a small pebble and we, we kind of throwing it out into a swamp and it kind of hits that, that water, that swamp water and just kind of sinks down and you feel like, man, did that even do anything? I mean, I, I prayed and it just feels like I like with all that I had, I chucked that thing out and it just hit the water and it just disappeared. It just feels like that didn't matter. One iota, it didn't matter at all. I just kind of, yeah. And then God, you want me to throw another pebble out? Why? I just threw the pebble. Did you see it? It just, it didn't do anything. And we just kind of feel like that. It's like, I I pray and then I just kind of move past it. But the analogy as I heard it is that you throw a stone in the swamp and then the next day you go and you throw another stone in the swamp in the same place. And then the third day, you throw another stone in the swamp in the same place. And the next day and on and on and on. And pretty soon, eventually, what ends up happening is that the small stones that you throw begin to crest the surface of that swamp and they begin to build up something that you can see and something you can stand upon. And the idea is this, is that eventually the seemingly small and insignificant thing, that small stone, that small prayer that's thrown consistently over time, it makes a difference. So here's what we need to do. We need to continue to learn to ask and to pray consistently. We need to keep throwing stones. And you know what? It's like, it's the hundredth stone. It's the hundred and first stone. It's the hundred and second stone. And it just doesn't seem to be making a difference. And then one day it seems like you throw that stone and boom, there it comes out the swamp. And you're like, I figured it out. I cracked the code. I mean, I did something right. What did I do different on time 327? Nothing, nothing. It's just that those stones that you've been throwing, they crested the surface. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep throwing stones. Petition, asking for ourselves, and intercession, asking on behalf of others. I'll close out point one with this story. Uh, Pete Gregg, out of the, um, the, the video series of How to Pray, he shares a story of a woman named Bertha of Kent. That sounds like a, a fun uh, name. That sounds like a fake character from somewhere. I don't know. Bertha of Kent but it was the daughter of the king of Paris, and she ended up marrying a pagan king of, of Kent. That's how you get the name Bertha of Kent, I guess. But she was born in 539 AD. So we're talking quite some time ago, and this is obviously, uh, she was the daughter of the king of Paris. This is over uh, also in England. So kind of in that area of the world over in Europe, she marries the king of Kent, and uh, she was a believer, and he was not. He was a pagan king. She was a Christian. And she began to pray for her husband. And for 17 years, you guys, she threw stones into the swamp. For 17 years, she just continued to intercede for her husband and continued to pray for his salvation, that he would know the love of God. And, you know, he was a a, a pagan man, but he was a good man. And he liked his wife. And so he was like, hey, I'm going to kind of build you this chapel, you know, for all of your Christian stuff, because that's real important to you. And he built her a chapel called the the Canterbury Cathedral, which is still around and still kind of a big deal. And so he built that on his land. And as she continued to pray for 17 years, she prayed for her husband. And something happened is that the Pope from Rome actually sent St. Augustine up to the place where they were, and her husband, the king, converted to Jesus. He turned his life over to Jesus. And what ends up happening is that the, the, the Christianity really in that, in that part of the world and in that part of Europe actually is birthed out of this specific thing. The Anglican Church of England is actually birthed out of this specific scenario, the, the Canterbury Cathedral and this family. And her prayers for her husband for 17 years, you guys, she thought she was praying for her husband, throwing the stones in the swamp and couldn't figure out why it wasn't working, why God's not answering her prayer. Little did she know she wasn't just praying for her husband. She was actually praying for Christianity to come to that portion of Europe and to sprout and to start. She was praying for the birthing of an arm of the Christian church that would actually go forward and carry the gospel to to a nation and to a continent. And as if you study your Christian history and you study American history to a whole nother nation here and really to change the Western world and the entire world. And so 
What Bertha of Kent couldn't figure out as she was throwing little stones and little pebbles into a swamp is that one day those prayers for her husband would crest up, launch the Anglican church and change the course of the world. Guys, we ask for ourselves and we ask for others. We keep praying, we keep asking, we keep knocking, we pray incrementally. Don't just pray the big prayers, pray incrementally. God doesn't make tables, he makes trees. We partner with him to make tables and we need to be praying that way. Man, that's good, Pastor Scott. Good job. Yeah, thanks. Hey, pray, P-R-A-Y. And guys, we're gonna get into why now, which is yield. And I'm actually gonna teach through this rather quickly. I just wanna give you some ideas and I actually wanna pray over you. But the second part of this is yield and the last letter of our pray, P-R-A-Y, pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. Yield is, yes, it's saying yes to God, it's yielding. In Matthew 6, 10, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's like, hey, God, you're God, I'm not. You're in charge, I'm not. You're my Lord and my master. I am not in charge of my life, God, you're in charge of my life. And at this portion of prayer, as we've paused and as we've rejoiced over him as our father and who he is and what he's done and what he's gonna do, and then we've asked for our manna, for our daily bread, we move to this place where we yield ourselves. And we say, God, you are God and I am not. I worship, I lay myself down. It's the prayer of Gethsemane. It's Luke twenty two forty two. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. It's Jesus in the garden. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And I started thinking about this idea of yielding. Where can we yield? Where do, where do we go? Where are the areas in our life where we yield? Well, there's all sorts of different areas where we can yield, but I just wrote down a few in my notes. Sin, places of sin. And as you're listening to this, maybe something prompts up for you. Um, some of those sins are sins of um, commission, things that we do where we go too far. Some of them are sins of omission, things we should have done that we didn't do. But these are areas, some of the addictions, these are areas where we can say, God, I surrender to you in this area. I surrender this area of my life. God, I surrender my sexuality to you, whatever the area is for you. But to say, God, you are in charge of my life. I'm not in charge of my life. And I surrender to you. I yield to you. I say yes to you. I pray the prayer of Gethsemane to you. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in my life as it is in heaven's sin. I wrote down another one, shame. For many of us, um, what comes right behind that sin thing is we can't actually deal with the sin thing because the shame kind of comes in so quick. And But we can yield shame too. You realize that you are the, if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are righteous before God because of the person of Jesus Christ. That's a yielding, you guys. That's a trust. That is to say that I will come boldly to the throne of grace in my time of need to receive mercy because of the person of Jesus Christ. Not because of my deeds and my goodness, but because of who Jesus is. That is how I stand righteous before the Father. That's a yielding. That's to say yes. That's to say, today I feel shameful, Father, but I lay my shame down because that is not from you. And God, I pick up your righteousness, the righteousness that was provided for me in Jesus Christ. That is a yielding. That's a yielding of shame. Forgiveness, for many of us, we just won't forgive somebody. And as you're watching this, you know, it's uh, the Holy Spirit maybe is prompting something for you right now. We just won't forgive. And we're like, but Pastor Scott, you, or Holy, Holy Spirit, you don't understand. You don't understand what was done to me. You don't understand how wrong I was. Here's the deal. It, it, I'm sure it was wrong. I'm sure it was incredibly painful. That's a whole separate issue. And you can actually talk to God about that and deal with that. And hey, I'm a fan of counseling and all of those things. But here's the deal. Forgiveness is a choice. And forgiveness doesn't actually hurt, the, unforgiveness doesn't hurt them, it actually just hurts you. I heard someone say one time, holding on unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for someone else to die. And here's the thing, you guys, forgiveness is a yielding. Forgiveness is a yes. Forgiveness is, God, you love me and forgave me when I needed forgiveness, which I still need forgiveness, ongoing forgiveness. And God, I choose as an act of my will to forgive that person. God, I forgive them for what they did. I forgive them for how it impacted me and how it makes me feel still to this day. God, I forgive them. And God, I ask you to help me forgive. I yield to your way. I yield to you as my Lord and my Savior. Go through a couple more of these rather quickly, but your assignment. For some of us, God gave you an assignment and it's just been sitting dormant on the shelf. You know, the gifting and calling of God are irrevocable. They are still there for you. God still has that available to you and he still is calling you. And so for some of us, that's a yield. That's a, that's a point of yielding. And can I just remind you and assure you, I've talked with a whole lot of people and they feel like to yield to God in assignment means that they go into vocational ministry. I, man, that is not true. That is not the truth. Uh, I have so many friends that serve God faithfully on assignment, evangelism, discipleship by doing whatever they do. 
doctors and teachers and dentists and man, we need, we need people that love Jesus in all of those places. And God assigns his people, his sons and daughters in all of those places. So please don't feel like, oh man, I got to move to another country and be a missionary to be faithful to an assignment. That's not, that's not it. Now for some of us, for, for somebody, if God told you to do that, then you got to wrestle with him on that. But I'm just saying that for most of us, that's where we go. And for most of us, I don't know that that's our assignment. I think for most of us, God, uh, the, the New Testament, Paul says this, he says, continue on in the calling, in the, the, the degree of which you were called. I, I probably didn't paraphrase that well. And I don't have this, the scripture reference. You can go look it up. But Paul basically says the, the place where you were operating before, as you were converted and, and, and released to Christ, turned your life over to Christ, continue to, to work. The, hey, if you were a football player before, maybe Jesus wants you to stay in that vein, but he just wants you to bring him with you. If you were a teacher before, converting to Christ doesn't mean that you abandon that and you go do something else. It means that you bring Christ with you. And that's the assignment. But some of us need to yield to assignment. Some of us need to yield to humility something God's been speaking to you and dealing with you on for a long time. And there's a humble step that you need to take. And it is a, it's a place of yielding for you. For some of us, it's a place of trust that we need to trust God. Maybe it's in a, maybe it's in finances, it's in giving, it's in tithing and, and um, it's in trusting him financially. Maybe for some of us, it's trusting him and serving. Maybe for some of us, it's in opening our heart again to love and, and to, to be connected intimately with other people, maybe with God's people. Maybe you've been hurt by the church. I, I don't know what it is, but it's an area of trust for you where God says, I want you to yield to me. Whatever it is, there's these places of yielding. And I, I love this analogy is that if your life is a house, if my life is a house, you know, I don't know if you're anything like me, but you have people come over to your house and there's like, you know, 90% or maybe depending on your house or your apartment, maybe the percentages are different, but there's like the 90% where you're like, you're comfortable with people being in those places. It's like, hey, just hang out in the house, go anywhere you want. But like, hey, that one closet over there, don't, don't, go, don't open that closet. Or hey, the garage that's off limits, don't go in the garage. Or hey, that, that room in the basement, don't go down there. Or, or, you know, like if you have like the proverbial junk drawer in your house, like we always had it growing up. We always had that one drawer where it's like all the stuff that no one else knew where it went, it went in the drawer. It was like, it was like random erasers and paper clips and pens and pencils and like a fork that like was from somebody else's house. You know what I'm talking about? It's just like that random drawer that's got crap and junk in it. And, you know, and it's like our lives are like those houses. We have those closets. We have those rooms. We have those drawers where it's like, hey, God. When you come over, when I'm praying, when I'm talking to you, and I do the pause thing, and I do the rejoice thing, and I do the ask thing, but then I get to the yield thing, and I'm like, God, there are some rooms, there are some drawers, there are some closets where I'm like, I don't, God, I don't, I, don't really, I don't really feel comfortable with you in my whole house. And yielding the why of pray is the place where we wrestle with God, and we learn to yield to him. We learn to say yes to him. We learn the prayer of the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not my will, but your will be done. It's the place where we bow our knee to the authority of scripture. And we say, I'm not going to rewrite scripture. I'm going to let it rewrite me. This is the place where we yield. It's the place where we open all the drawers. It's the place where we open all the corners, all the rooms, all the closets. And we say, God, come in, have every piece and every part of me. And God, if there's a place of sin in my life, God, a commission or omission, God, I went too far. I didn't go far enough. God, I surrender that to you. God, come in, help me. God, empower me. God, I surrender this. I yield to you. God, in the places of shame, I yield to you. God, in the places where I just cannot forgive, God, come in and help me. I yield to you. I open that closet to you. I open that drawer to you. And so as we talk and as we look at prayer, this is the place where we bow our knee and we say, God, you are God and I am not. So let me pray over us as we close this morning. And I want to just pray and I want to pray over you. You have manna type needs. You have practical needs where you need manna from heaven today. You need, you need to ask and God, you need to ask God for, for stuff and for help. And you might need to petition him for yourself. You might need to intercede on behalf of someone else, but you need to ask. And I want to just lead us in prayer for that. And we want to ask God for our needs. And, and then I want to just pray this yield prayer over us. And I want to invite you to pray this um, as I prayed over you, to, to pray it and to mean it and to apply it to those areas in your life where you're like, that's that closet, that's that drawer. And I'm gonna open it to him today. Let me pray over us. Father, thank you for today. God, I pray over your sons and daughters. We come to you together. God, your word says that we're two or more, two or three more of us are gathered. 
God, that you are in the midst of us, so we know that you're here right now. God, we thank you for your power over our life right now. We thank you for your absolute sovereignty over us right now. And God, as we're learning to pray, God, we come today and God, we exercise, we practice, God, asking. So God, I pray right now for every person within the sound of my voice. They have needs. And God, you know what they are. I don't know what they are, but God, you know what they are. And I pray, God, as we are just even in this moment, that they would begin to articulate those needs to you. The manna needs, the needs for provision, the needs for healing, the needs for stuff and help. God, stuff and help. And God, so we bring our needs to you and we ask you, God. And in the continuous present tense, we are asking right now. And God, we will continue to ask. And so, God, we bring our needs before you and we ask you. Go ahead, you guys, as we're praying, just, just put, put the words in your mouth to ask. Go right now, just begin to ask him. Just begin to call out to him for the stuff and the help that you need. Petition for your own life and intercession for the lives of those around you. Just begin to ask him. Just go ahead and ask him. And for some of us, as we're trying to pray it out, it's hard for us to ask. We don't even know what to ask. We don't know how to pray incrementally. We don't know, uh, we don't know what we actually even need or what we actually even want. I would just ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to help you pray out this morning. So God, right now, I pray over, over your sons and daughters. I pray for every need that they have. God, they have, they have needs for you to be, to show yourself strong as provider. God, they have needs for you to show yourself strong in peace and joy. God, I, we have p people that are praying for mental health, God, that, that you need to go in and rewrite the way that they think. That I pray the mind of Christ over them right now. God, I just thank you, God, for all the needs represented. You know what they are but we put voice to them and we ask you and we keep asking you, God, we keep throwing stones today. God, we don't need tables. We just need trees. And so God, we come and we ask today. And God, as we ask, we thank you for meeting us. God, we thank you that your word says that as we ask and keep asking, we will receive. And so I thank you, God, in Jesus' name that we pray in line with your will, according to your word, according to your promises. And God, we thank you for meeting every single need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that today. And God, I pray just as we move off of asking into yielding. God, we come to you right now. We just proclaim and declare that you are our Lord and Savior. You are God and we are not. God, you are in charge of our lives. We bow our knee to you. We bow our hearts to you. God, make our lives a living sacrifice. And God, we pray right now, God, all of the drawers, all of the corners of the rooms, every closet, God, it's open to you. God, come into our house, come into my house. You guys can pray this. Come into my house and go anywhere you wanna go. Go to any corner, anything, Jesus, that doesn't look like you, smell like you, act like you, come in and, and just, just get in the middle of it. God, we pray right now over places of sin and shame and unforgiveness and, God, places where assignments have been laid dormant. God, we pray over places of pride where we need to humble ourselves. God, we, play, we pray over places where we are struggling to trust and we yield to you. God, not our will, but your will be done. God, continue to show us who you are. Show us what you want us to do. And we say, yes, God, we open our hearts to you. Come in and have every piece and every part. Make us look like you. Make us more like you. God, we long for you and we want you to be our Lord and Savior in every practical way possible. Come in and have your way in us today. God, we thank you for that. God, come in to the whole house. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come and may your will be done in our lives as it is in heaven. And Father, if you're willing, there are some things that we'd probably like you to take from us. But God, not our will, but your will be done. We surrender to you today and we thank you for your goodness over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, if you've never received Jesus before as your Lord and Savior, I want to lead you in a prayer. And for those of you who have, you can actually be praying right now as, a, as we're in this space that people would just be able to see the goodness of God and really know him for who he is. And if you've never done that, the Bible says that Jesus was the son of God, that he came and died on the cross to pay for your sin and that he went in the ground and was there for three days and then raised from the dead. 
to prove that he had death, uh, that he had power over death, hell, and the grave, and that he could actually open the gateway back to God and into eternal life. And then he turns and he offers us to come with him. And he says, hey, if you will trust in me as your Lord and Savior, you'll trust in me, not in your goodness, not in a religious kind of thing, but if you will trust in my gift to you, I will give you eternal life. And so as Christians, we like to pray this prayer where we just, it's just a prayer of surrender to say, God, I, I want you to have my life. I declare that you are my Lord and Savior and I receive that gift from you of salvation. So pray this with me. If you've never started a relationship with Jesus, you can just pray this, just say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you came and paid for my sin. The places where I've gone too far or not gone far enough. Jesus, you came to, to pay what I could never pay. And right now I make a declaration out of my mouth and in my heart that you are my Lord and savior. I believe you're the son of God that you died on the cross, that you rose again, and that you offer me the gift of salvation. And right now I receive that gift. I surrender my life to you and I ask you to come in and to have every piece and every part of me, every room, every door, drawer, every closet is open to you. Come in and change me. And God, I thank you for loving me right where I am, just as I am, and loving me too much to leave me there. Thank you for inviting me into eternal life. Thank you that I'll live with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Hey, if you pray that prayer, first of all, best decision you'll ever make in your life. Second of all, it says in the Bible that all of the angels in heaven are rejoicing, and we're rejoicing with you too, and we would love to know about it. Uh, if you would let us know, if you text the keyword element to 97,000 on that form, it says, I made a decision for Jesus today. If you'd let us know, man, we would like to celebrate with you, and I'd even love to pray just even in my own personal time over you, and um, man, if you would let us know, that would be a huge blessing to us, and we're just so excited for you. Hey, get involved in the good Bible-believing church. We like elements, so keep getting involved in this. Find a people of God to be a part of. And hey, you guys, it's been an absolutely amazing morning together. And this has been a great series, right? How to pray. Love it so much. Hey, let's keep it simple. Let's keep it real. And let's keep it up. Let's continue to pray. And as we go into a time of worship this morning, I want to extend our time today of asking and yielding wherever the Holy Spirit needs to work in your heart today. Would you just go ahead and, and lean into that as we worship together this morning? Guys, let's ask and let's yield uh, you've got your assignment, man. Let's, uh, let's get into worship and prayer together this morning.